Good evening. My name is uh, Petko and welcome to Ratio Online. I'm happy to see you all again uh, now in this uh, in this rainy evening. I, I do hope that many of you uh, tuned in uh, to listen to uh, you know what's what's coming up ahead. And what's coming up ahead uh, is, uh, is supposed to be quite interesting. Uh, today, I'm very delighted uh, to have the opportunity to speak uh, with Matthew Kopp. Uh, most of you have, uh, if you are joining this event, probably already know who Matthew is. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and you know just 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 quickly uh, quickly remind you. Uh, so Matthew uh, is officially known as a professor of uh, zoology from the University of uh, Manchester, but I would rather say that he's more of a, a neurobiologist. Um, because uh, his particular field of study is uh, is studying uh, you know neurons and new uh, and neural systems and, and nematode worms, um, so uh, he has delivered quite a few talks with uh, with Ratsi already. Uh, all of them, I would say, you know, pretty fascinating. So uh, we had a talk about the olfactory system and about aliens, which is obviously a usual topic for a zoologist, I guess. Uh, so uh, it was uh, it was really really nice to see Matthew on stage, uh, you know, a few months back, and we do hope uh, to see him again on stage. Uh, but having said all that, um, you know, just a, a quick reminder: uh, Matthew is uh, not only an excellent speaker, as uh, probably many of you uh, already know uh, if you've been to the live events, but uh, he's also a wonderful writer. Uh, has written written. You know, quite a lot of books, uh, all of them uh, receiving, you know, raving reviews and, uh, and you know, very widely accepted as, uh, uh, you know, as an example of, of how uh, science should be communicated. Uh, his last book, uh, uh, the, the most recent, recent book that he's written is Life's Greatest Secret, The Race to Crack the Genetic Code. And he has recently published a new one, which is going to be, uh, you know, at the, at the core of our event uh, today, uh, the, the idea of the brain. Uh, and I'm not going to say a lot about the book uh, because, uh, you know, this will be uh, the privilege of Matthew to, to speak about the, the subject matter. I would just like to say that um, it is really rare to see um, a scientist uh, uh, using narrative and, and, and history and historical nonfiction to deliver, to deliver us a topic with uh, such an explanatory power. And, and uh, you know, honestly, it's, it's rare to see such a, such a fun read, which at the same time is so, is so um, and, and informative. So he's, he's doing something pretty rare. You know, he's, uh, uh, he's combining, um, you know, successful usage of, na of, of narrative and, and, and story to communicate science, which is essentially what we at Ratio have been trying to do for the last eight years. So uh, Matthew really is, uh, is an example for us on, uh, on how, uh, on how science communication should be done in terms of rhetoric, in terms of form, uh, and in terms of quality. Uh, so now I'm pretty sure because Matthew can hear me right now, he's probably slightly embarrassed by everything that I said. I don't know. Did I go over the top, Matthew? No, no not enough. Not enough. More, more. Not enough. All right. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're not known with your modesty as well. You know, the shirt speaks for itself. <laughs> it's nice to see you, Matthew. How are you doing? Yeah, it's good to see you, Petco. I'm fine. I'm fine. A bit bored because of lockdown, but I'm okay. Right. Yeah. You know, it's it, it has become quite customary to, uh, you know, when we start our events to have a, a quick chat about this whole COVID situation. But I want to do something different right now. And, uh, you know, with the, uh, besides, uh, you know, the obvious that we all have uh, stuff to complain, you know, I want you to brag about something, you know, just can you quickly tell me what was the best thing that happened to you in the last three months? In a lot, what before, since lockdown began, well, the, the worst thing right. is, is the weight I'm putting on from not getting exercise, despite, you know, because I don't ride my bike to work anymore. Um, the best thing was, was, idea, was the best thing I think probably has actually been I mean, I had in my diary was full of events that I was supposed to be. I was supposed to be in Sofia. I was supposed to be seeing you, seeing the audience That's directly. Right. But all that went. But then there's been this new world that has appeared, this new way of communicating and new audiences who we're encountering uh, through this different medium. And whilst it's very frustrating not to be able to see people and to directly sense the audience, I think that there are... There are a lot of things we've learned that I hope when it's all over, we don't go necessarily go back to a lot of travel isn't necessary. Uh, right. you know, big business meetings where you don't actually need to, you can just do it quickly, you know, by a mail or by zoom. So I think there right. are, 
there are some good things that are going to come out of this, apart from the, the horror that has affected so many people. Right. Well, you as a scientific historian, I would uh, I would allow myself to, to describe you as such. I mean, you, you objectively are such a, <laughs> such a person. Uh, you know, it's, it's an obvious fact that uh, people and civilizations learn from diversity. So it's a uh, uh, it's obvious that we will not only bounce back, but we will bounce back and come back, uh, you know, in a slightly better, better shape. Uh, so speaking about history, you have written, you know, a really, really fascinating books. Uh, I, I read quite a lot of reviews, uh, and it's, uh, um, and I've been surprised of how uh, little, um, you know, difference in opinion I, 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 I see. You know, everybody is <clears throat> uh, is really thrilled by your style of delivery. And uh, they say that you know it's a it, it is a it is a book that we haven't seen for quite for quite a while. So are you happy with uh, with what you've done there? Uh, well, with the reception, yes, it's been fantastic. Um, right, it's been great. I've been very you know the critical reception. Apart from one man on Amazon who said that it should have been written by Bill Bryson, uh, which <laughs> maybe he's right. I don't know. Everybody else uh, has been. I mean, it's been fantastic. It's been it's right. been it's been really good. All right, Matthew. Uh, well, uh, there's quite a lot to cover, a lot of interesting things to talk about. I will leave, you know, most of the questions that I have, uh, you know, obviously uh, after after the talk. Just want to remind our viewers, I'm, I'm sure that they can see the information, um, you know, below uh, that they can submit their questions using the platform Slido. Uh, so, you know, listen carefully, uh, submit your questions, and I will try uh, to uh, you know, to pass them to, uh, to Matthew as, uh, as, as many of them as, as possible. Uh, so now, uh, without further ado, uh, Matthew, I'm going to give you the stage and you can go ahead and deep dive us into the history of brain science. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Petco. Um, sure. Good evening, or is it good? Yes, it is evening there. <laughs> good evening. It's an early evening for us here. Uh, great to not see so many people, but I'm sure you're all there. Uh, and this is, once again, thanks to everybody at Razio who has been fantastic, professional, organized this uh, in the most remarkable way. Now, I'm gonna share my screen uh, and then we can start the talk. Um, here we go. Is it gonna work? There. Right. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is the idea of the brain, of how different people down the centuries have thought about this organ in our head and what it is supposed to be doing. And I'll take you right up to the edge of knowledge, to what the most latest discoveries about the brain and our understanding of it. And indeed, I'm going to take you into the future. We're going to look at the future of what the future might hold for understanding how the brain works. So, the first thing is that although you all know and I know that I'm using my brain right now to think, to come up with the ideas to put into your heads, that hasn't always been the case. For most of humanity's history, most cultures didn't think that the brain did much at all. Instead, we thought that it was our heart. We thought that the heart was what was producing emotions, was involved in thought, and so on. And we can actually see this in phrases. All our languages have the remnants, the kind of fossilized remains of that old idea. So oops. here we go. For most of our people, for most of our history, people have thought that thinking is done with the heart, not with the brain. Here are some of those phrases in English and in Bulgarian. Take it to heart, heartbroken, cross my heart. Here are the phrases that you all know and use. And imagine replacing the word heart in those phrases by the brain. <laughs> it would just sound silly. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't have the same power. And so those words, those phrases, which are still there, despite what we know, we know that it's the, the brain that is doing all the thinking, the heart's just a pump. So nevertheless, we can feel, we can sense the pull of these old ideas which go back tens of thousands of years. Now, to understand how we got to realizing that these ideas about the heart were wrong, we need to go back to the ancient Greeks. In general, they're the people who really thought about things, and certainly they're the first people to write things down. And 
the founder really of ancient Greek philosophy, Aristotle, he had a very, very clear idea. He thought that the heart was the center of thought, just like everybody else. He thought that the, the heart was doing the thinking and that your emotions and your ideas went round your body in the blood. And the brain, he thought, was just some kind of radiator that cooled the blood as it went round and then came down again. He didn't think it played any role at all. Now, shortly after Aristotle's time, a number of Greek thinkers, Herophilus, Erasistratus, and Hippocrates, who you'll have heard of, all argued that in fact the mind is in the brain. They shifted the idea from the heart to the brain, but they didn't actually provide any evidence for why this might be so. They couldn't point to anything beyond to talk about the, the similarity, the, the, the closeness of the brain and the main sense organs, the, the taste, vision, smell, hearing, they're all near the, near the head, near the brain, not in the heart. That was about their only real argument. They couldn't really explain why they th thought that. And part of the problem all along in identifying the role of the brain, and we'll see this even up to the present day, is what, how you can prove your idea, what experiments you can do to demonstrate this. And what I'm gonna say now is a bit gruesome, uh, but it is quite significant. And this was indeed an experiment done to settle this question. And it was done by Galen. Uh, here's a medieval portrait of it, and he certainly didn't look like that. Um, but Galen, often known now as the founder of what passed for medicine uh, in the West for about 1500 years, Galen was also an experimenter, he was a surgeon, he was an anatomist, he was a poet and a philosopher, absolutely remarkable man. And in around about 200 AD, the common era, he did an experiment on a pig. So this is a medieval illustration of the experiment. It was very, very well known. You take a pig, I'm, I'm afraid the pig is conscious, this is long before the days of anesthetic, and you've chained it down and what Galen did, Galen was convinced that the brain was the origin of thought. So he had this kind of public display in which one of his opponents who was convinced that it was the heart had to do the experiment. And what Galen did was to open the poor old pig's body and the beating hearts there. And he made his opponent hold the heart. And so you can stop the heart beating. And of course the animal carried on struggling and whining and generally being unhappy. So the animal is still conscious, even though its heart had stopped beating. On the other hand, if you open the skull of the pig and then you press on its brain, instantly it will go unconscious and stop making a noise. So Galen had done an experiment to prove the point. However, although this was very well known, because Aristotle was so important and so many people accepted his whole worldview that his idea carried on for millennia. Many people all over the world who knew about culture, who knew about philosophy, agreed with Aristotle. Of course, for ordinary people who weren't aware of all this, something much simpler told them that it was the heart because when you're excited, your heart races. You can feel, uh, if you're nervous, you'll feel it in your guts and in your heart. You know, you, your, your brain doesn't really do what we're told. You know, you've got this mind in your brain looking out through the eyes. It doesn't actually feel like that when you're engaged in the world. You don't feel as though you're a little person looking out of your eyes. You feel as though you're in your body. Your body is fundamentally important for sending messages all the time. So most people around the world, they weren't involved in all these debates. Most ordinary people were quite convinced that it's your heart or your guts. Some cultures even thought it was the liver. So some part of your anatomy, but not the brain. Now, it took an awful long time for this issue to be resolved and Eventually, by the 18th century, so that's 1600 years after Galen had done his experiment, over 2000 years since Aristotle had come up with the radiator idea, by the 18th century, European thinkers accepted that it was the brain that was fundamental. And I've got a quick quotation from Priestley, who was a, a, an English chemist. 
and he wrote in 1775, in my opinion, there is just the same reason to conclude that the brain thinks as that it is, it is white and soft. In other words, for Priestley, it was self-evident that it's the brain that is doing the thinking. <clears throat> and he said, there is no instance of any man retaining the faculty of thinking when his brain was destroyed. And whenever that faculty is impeded or injured, there is sufficient reason to believe that the brain is disordered in proportion. So Priestley was able to point to various examples where people have been kicked in the head or whatever by a horse and they showed changes to their behavior and their thinking and that like the general complexity of the brain when you look at it anatomically led thinkers to accept that the brain and the thought and thought were the same thing the heart it was realized in the 17th century is merely a pump it's a very strange kind of pump but it is simply pumping blood around our bodies it's not doing any thinking at all. Now, once it had been accepted that the brain played this role, people began to think about, well, how does it actually work? What is it doing? And they thought this despite the fact that there was no brain-centric moment. There wasn't a single decisive experiment. There wasn't uh, one second where everything changed. There was no apple falling from the tree that made everybody realize. Instead, it was this slow accumulation of experiments, of anatomy that finally convinced people. And when they realized that the brain was significant, thinkers such as Descartes, the French philosopher, tried to work out what was going on. And Descartes began, what you're going to see is the theme of this talk and of my book, and that's of the link between ideas of the brain and technology of the time. People consistently use technology to explain the brain. And Descartes was particularly taken by these statues that he could see in Paris parks. These statues are powered by water and they were kind of animatronic. They would come out of the, of the undergrowth. Um, you would see a man hitting a dragon. And you can see all this is just done by pipes and weights full of water, which would change the movement of these uh, statues. And Descartes thought, well, in that case, maybe that's how the brain works. Maybe there's, in our nerves, there is a fluid such that if we are burnt, then this fluid moves very quickly up into the brain and then comes back down again to get us to move our leg away. This very simple kind of reflex uh, response we can see here. Now, Descartes was wrong and almost as soon as his uh, work was published after his death, uh, people demonstrated this by a very simple way. If you get a nerve in any animal and you chop it, then water doesn't come spurting out. There's no fluid under pressure in there that could produce the kind of effects that Descartes had seen uh, with his statues. But nonetheless, Descartes had made a decisive breakthrough by trying to use technology to understand what the brain does and how it does it. And this can be seen, this idea of using technology can be seen at its most extreme in this absolutely extraordinary automaton called the writer. This is made in the 1770s by the Swiss watch watchmaker Pierre Jacques Droz, and you can still see this. This is on display in a Swiss museum. And we're going to play it in a minute, and you'll see that this little boy, he will move and he can write letters, literally a whole letter, with his little pen and ink. And effectively, this statue could be programmed to write different letters to make up words, but it could only ever do the same thing over and over again. Right, if we could just watch the video now, please. <laughs> writing the letters, and even the eyes flicking from side to side eerily as the little boy watches what's happening. Now, nobody thought that this was actually what was going on 
inside a brain. Nobody imagined that we were made of all these cogs in our heads that were whirring around and producing this kind of behavior. But clearly, you, what it was showing was that you could use a machine to make something very much like a human being in all sorts of quite remarkable ways. But the problem was, if you opened up a skull, you didn't see anything like cogs. You couldn't see anything. There's no way of connecting this automaton with what you can find inside a head. And the big breakthrough in understanding what the brain might be doing came at the middle and end of the 18th century with the discovery of electricity. Electricity, which was first produced uh, in, by storing it in jars, which would give an instantaneous discharge, like a shock. And you could actually use this to show that, for example, uh, frog's legs would move if they were stimulated by this electric shock. So people became aware that there was something in bodies that was responsive to electricity. The big breakthrough came at the beginning of the 19th century when it was now possible to store electricity in what we would call a battery. So this would give a continuous discharge over several minutes, a slow discharge rather than a sudden kind of shock. And what that meant you could do is something really quite terrifying. Here we've got an image of a man who's just been hanged for killing his wife and daughter. This it took place in London and uh, the experimenter Aldini is getting two electrodes. He's putting them on either side of the dead man's body, on either side of the head, and then connecting them, his assistant here, is connecting them to the battery. And what happened then is the eyes opened, would roll about, the mouth would move and grind, and the arms and legs would start to flail about. So this was literally terrifying, it appeared as though the body was being brought back to life by the power of electricity. And some of you may know, it was watching a demonstration like this, but in fact on a dead animal, uh, not on a, a dead human, thankfully, that the young Mary Godwin uh, watched this such a display in London in about 1810. Uh, and about six years later, she wrote a, a, a very famous horror story called Frankenstein uh, under her married name, Mary Shelley. So this kind of demonstration had a tremendous influence on popular culture. And above all, it suggested very, very strongly that bodies had some kind of electricity inside them. And when a few decades later, the telegraph system began to be developed, Telegraph was invented in the mid 1830s. And within a decade, there were telegraph networks covering whole countries, or indeed in the case of the United States, whole continents. And thinkers drew parallels between the way that a, a telegraph system is organized and the way that the nervous system is organized in the body. And they began to wonder whether just as there are electrical messages going down the wires of the telegraph system from one part to another, perhaps there are messages going down the nerves from one part of our, from our head down to our body. And the man who took this idea uh, particularly seriously was this man here, Alfred Smee. Now, I bet none of you have ever heard of him. I hadn't heard of him before I started uh, work on my book. Uh, he was a, an inventor in the middle of the 19th century. He worked for the Bank of England. Uh, he invented all sorts of things, special inks, special batteries. Um, and he became convinced that, as he put it, we really have electrotelegraphic communication in the nervous system. That which is seen or felt or heard is telegraphed to the brain. And he actually tried to draw up a diagram of how this electrical nervous system might work. And here we've got two versions. This is from one of his popular books. We got the, the animal nervous system with the muscles down here, the, the sensory systems, the eye, the ear, and the skin. And here are the nerves going through up into the brain in this kind of rather mysterious crisscross formulation here. And what he argued is that this showed how the idea of a nest may be implanted in the bird or of a honeycomb in the wasp or the bee. 
And he argued that this very simple way of organizing things could explain uh, exactly that. Now, I'm not quite sure he's right, because I've looked at this diagram for a long time and it doesn't really help me very much. Although modern day uh, computer scientists get very excited by it. What was the difference between an animal and a human? Well, here's the human. And you can see we've got several layers extra of this kind of hierarchical organization. But despite being uh, having this kind of modern flavor to it, Smee's ideas were not very influential. He's largely forgotten now. What's striking is that he's missed out something which was very commonly accepted at the time. And that is, you can see there's no, these functions here, this is dealing with the eye and this is dealing with the ear, but there's no higher cognitive functions, don't have any localization in any of these points. And yet, at this moment in history, people were absolutely convinced that there was localization of function in different parts of the brain. This is the pseudoscience known as phrenology, which began at the beginning of the 19th century and became immensely popular. Virtually every 19th century novelist uses phrenology at one point of it or another. Charles Dickens made a reference to it. Um, Conan Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories, when Sherlock Holmes first meets Moriarty, his arch enemy, Moriarty makes a very rude comment about the lumps on Sherlock Holmes's skull because Moriarty, like Holmes, is a phrenologist. The idea is that by feeling the skull, you can actually feel the organs of the brain. And those are different structures that carry out a different function or express a different faculty. We can see here uh, that time is supposedly located here. Uh, humor, mirthfulness up here in the brain, uh, acquisitiveness or greed is here above the ear. Now, this is all nonsense. It's complete and utter rubbish because, you know, the brain is in the skull and the skull is very, very thick and the shape of the skull does not correspond to the shape of the brain underneath it. And we don't have all these separate uh, areas that are different organs. It's all rubbish, but it became extremely popular. Uh, partly because novelists and intellectuals took it up, but also because it was actually saying two very important things. It was saying, firstly, that the mind and ideas are simply the brain. There is nothing else. There is simply the brain. There is no spirit in there. It is the brain and its organization that does everything. So it's very materialist. And secondly, it was making this point about there is some localization of function in the brain. Different bits of the brain appear to do different things. And many scientists were initially opposed to this, partly because it was a very popular uh, pseudoscience, but also because they were initially convinced on kind of philosophical grounds that the, the brain must be completely undifferentiated. It was the same everywhere. But in the middle of the 19th century, that idea began to change. And we can see here evidence that shows why that changed. This man here is called David Ferrier. He was a young neurosurgeon and he started to do a set of experiments using very slender electrodes, which he would insert into the brain, the outer layers of the brain of a monkey. And using batteries that were in fact, in fact invented by Smee, very powerful, gentle batteries, he would give very delicate air stimulation to these different areas. And he noticed that in some areas, if you stimulated part of the brain, a hand would move, or even the monkey's ears would twitch as though it had heard something, it would turn its head. So he was able to map out these different parts of the brain. And because of he knew his anatomy, he could draw similarities between the monkey brain here and the human brain here. So you can see these are the same areas, 14, 14, 14, here. There was a complete parallel between the sensitivity of the monkey brain to electrode stimulation and what you could observe both anatom anatomically and in the case of patients who had died after a stroke, 
you could remark, for example, that parts of their brain were affected by the stroke and they were the ones that corresponded, those areas corresponded, say, to uh, hearing or the power of movement. So Ferrier was able to show that there was this precise correlation between the way the monkey's brain is organized and ours. But there was one exception and I'm using it right now. And that's this part here. It's called Broca's area. Broca was a French neuroscientist who in 1860, to his great dismay, became convinced that this left front side of the brain is devoted to the production of speech. And he accepted this fact, which he wanted to disagree with because philosophy, French philosophy told them that the brain was uh, one whole structure and had no differentiation. He found that patients with strokes who'd lost the ability to speak all had lesions in this left frontal area of their brain. So this is localization. It's species specific. Monkeys can't talk. They don't have this area uh, in Broca's area. And most eerily of all, it's only on the left side. So unlike most parts of the brain, which are symmetrical, this area is asymmetrical. It's only on our left side. Now, <clears throat> this would suggest that all the brain is got little bits doing things and it's movement, controlling movement and so on. But at the same time, towards the end of the 19th century, thinkers began to realize that the brain was doing something much more interesting. It was actually active. And these two thinkers here came up with two fundamental ideas which we still accept today. The first is Helmholtz, who was a German uh, physiologist, and he came to the conclusion that the brain makes what he called inductive conclusions about the world. So rather than us just looking out of our eyes, in fact, argues Helmholtz, our brain is constructing that reality. You can see this Something as simple as seeing in, 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 in 3D, seeing in depth. If you cross, open one eye and then the other like that, you'll see slightly different images. You all know this. And yet your perception is of the world as a 3D space through which you can move. There are objects in front of one another. And you've done that by sticking the information from your two eyes together in your brain before you're even aware of it. The brain is drawing inductive conclusions about what is in front of each other. Quite remarkable. Morgan was an English psychologist and he came up with the idea that what the brain is doing overall is controlling. It's controlling our movements. It's stopping us from having reflex responses. If you think of the famous stories about chickens, you chop their head off and they'll carry on running for a while. That's because without the brain, that movement will just carry on. The brain, a lot of what the brain does is to inhibit us, to prevent us from having uncontrolled gestures and from stopping our reflexes from getting out of control. Now, around about this same time, in about the 1870s and 1880s, a new technology developed, which was much more interesting than the telegraph, and that's the telephone exchange. Now, the younger amongst you will have no idea what on earth is going on here. Uh, those of you who are a bit older might have seen this on films. Uh, no telephone exchange now works like this, but when I was growing up, they did. And what would happen is that you would telephone uh, to and you would pick up the phone and you would talk to uh, the receptionist, uh, the operator, who was normally a woman, uh, and she would see that your light had come on here and she'd connect your cable, a cable to this uh, hole corresponding to where your light had come on, and she could then talk to you through here. And you would say, I want a particular number, and if it was in the local exchange, she would see it on here, one of these numbers, and then would connect another cable to that number. So you could now talk to somebody on the exchange. If you wanted to phone further distance, then she'd send you off to another exchange in the city you wanted to talk to, and you'd talk there. Now, what's happening here is you've got electricity and messages, but it's flexible. There is, it can change over time. You can see that this telephone exchange is not fixed in all time. It's not like a telegraph system. You can decide how to route the message. 
and scientists and philosophers began to think of the brain as being, well, like a big telephone exchange. And the messages are being routed around by some kind of mysterious operator uh, in your head who's deciding where they're going to go. And this was taken to quite extreme detail by this man here who's called Arthur Keith. He was, uh, he gave the lectures in London. Every Christmas, there's something called the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures, which are given. And they're for children and they're about science. And a leading scientist will talk three or four days in hour long sessions about their science. And here we've got from the paper, from the book that was published on the basis of Keith's uh, lectures, the parallel between an, a telephone exchange and a reflex, like when you have an itch and you want to scratch, uh, or if you bang your knee and you move your leg in, an, in a knee jerk reflex. So Keith is saying, well, the nervous system is like a telephone exchange. But if you think about it, Keith hasn't really figured it out properly because the nervous system that he's describing here is a reflex. The message doesn't need to be rooted anywhere. If you've got an itch, you scratch. If you bang your knee, then you move it in a jerk. You can't uh, bang your knee, uh, bang your tendon, and then start scratching. It doesn't work that way. So the parallel actually breaks down, although he's tried to make it. About this, there's no flexibility here, and he doesn't either deal with, well, what's actually going along our nerves? There's an electricity and a message here. Is it the same thing? What is in our nerves? Keith didn't deal with that at all, but the implication is, is that it's something like a message going down a telegraph or a telephone wire. Scientists around about the same time started to experiment with what's called feedback, ways of making a system produce what looks like purposive behavior. This is an electronic version. It's called Selino the electric dog. Uh, and this chap here, Meissner, uh, he shines a, a torch on this photoelectric cell. And then this is the dog, I'm afraid. It's basically got three wheels. It's a box on three wheels. And it will move to try and keep the stimulation of the electric light as strong as possible. So if you shine on this side, it will move to the right. You can see there's a divisor here. There's another light here on the other side. If you shine on that side, it will move to that side. So you can control this device by a simple electric circuit, by the device trying to keep the signal as strong as possible. Now, I'm going to show you exactly how that works. And I'm going to give you an example from <coughs> this uh, man here called Locker. This is an example from a book he wrote in 1925. And it doesn't involve any electronics at all. Locker was uh, an, an ecologist, in fact, a theoretical ecologist, but he was interested in mathematics. And he was trying to work out how behavior might emerge from a very simple system. And he noticed this toy ladybird which you can still buy today, uh, and I got one. And we're gonna watch the video in a minute. Here, um, okay, if we can uh, play the video now, you can see that I'm about to put the, vi the, the, the robot, this little wind up uh, ladybird onto a plank, which I've put between two chairs. And the ladybird moves, goes around in a circle, and it doesn't fall off. It seems to be showing purposive behavior it seems to be able to avoid movement in a way that is avoid falling off, which is really quite remarkable. It looks like it knows what it's doing. Now it doesn't because it's just a very simple clockwork uh, device. And we can see here how it works. This is from Locker's, um, this is from uh, Locker's uh, book. How that device works is we have a wheel. That's the powered wheel here. And you have the antennae, those little feelers at the front, which keep the device level and means, oops, sorry, means it goes forwards until it falls off the edge. If the antennae go off the edge of the table, then the head will drop down, yeah? And this little wheel here, which we can see in profile, this is a free wheel. It's not connected to the motor and it will start moving as the device goes forward and it will turn it now in 
a circle because it's now touching the ground until the antennae come back onto the table, in which case it's now lifted off the ground. There's no contact and the device moves straight forward again. So you've got what looks like purposive behavior from a simple loop, which isn't, it's, it, it's, there's nothing there in fact. There's no wires. What is passing through here, what's happening, said Lotka, is the toy construes the information. It is working out what is coming from the antennae. It's a very strange little thing, but as you've seen, it really is quite remarkable. Now, what's going on here, that idea, how we can understand what's in neurons and what in fact is happening in that strange little toy, this is the work of Edgar Adrian. Now, like me, you won't have heard of Adrian, but to be honest, you should have done. Uh, he, oh, don't worry, English people haven't heard of him either. Uh, Edgar Adrian was one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century. He won the Nobel Prize uh, when he was in his early 30s. Two of his students won a Nobel Prize. He went on to run the University of Cambridge. Virtually every honor that you could imagine was given to him. Uh, and the main thing he did was to record from, from neurons to see what was in them. But he also wrote for the general public. Like, I, like I'm doing now, he thought that part of his job was to explain his findings to the general public. And to explain what he could see, he started to use these words like information, messages, code. The way that we now think about what's in neurons and what's in brains comes from Adrian's work for the general public. And he showed, for example, that if you get a, a frog muscle and you record from the, the, the neuron that's attached to it and you put a weight on it, and so you're stretching it a little bit more with increased weights, what he showed was that the number of responses increases. The code for weight in this particular neuron is numerical. The stronger the weight, the heavier the weight, the stronger the response that the neuron is giving. He also did another quite remarkable experiment. At the beginning of the 1930s, it was discovered that the human brain produces electrically detectable waves. This is called EEG, electroencephalograph. You'll all have heard of this. And you put electrodes on the outside of the brain. And if your subject is relaxed, and here we've got Adrian himself, he does the experiment himself. So these are just recording electrodes, They're not going into your head, it's just on the scalp. I've had this done, it's quite painless. And you shut your eyes and you just relax. Then the brain produces what are called alpha waves, these rhythmic behaviors as we are at rest. And this is the kind of thing that under lockdown, when we're all doing yoga, this is what you're aiming for, that relaxed zone. On the other hand, if you open your eyes, then that signal disappears instantaneously. You can also make it go away by telling the subject to keep their eyes shut and saying, please uh, work out the square root of 63 or something. Do some complicated maths and then people's uh, alpha waves disappear. But you can see, you shut your eyes and it comes straight back. What was remarkable was that Adrian didn't only do this on himself, he did it on a beetle. So this isn't a ladybird, but it's a water beetle, a large beetle that lives in water. And he put an electrode into its head and he showed that when it was dark, the beetle produced this nice rhythm, exactly the same as his. When you turn the light on, it disappears. And when you put it back in the dark, you get the rhythm back. I don't think he tried giving it a mathematical top problem to try and solve at this point. Anyway, so what we can see here is that the all brains seem to work in the same way. They produce these very relaxed rhythms, but then they disappear. Something mysterious is happening when the animal or the human is paying attention to what's going on. In the 1940s, a number of key breakthroughs were made as people thought much more clearly about what the brain might be, be doing. This man, uh, Kenneth Craik, he was an English uh, psychologist based in Cambridge. He came up with the idea that what brains actually do is they power, they parallel or model external events. In other words, they represent 
what is happening in the outside world. And they can even kind of manipulate that and project what might happen if you altered one of the conditions. So you can imagine what's going to happen. And this is not only something that human brains do, but that animal brains may be able to predict what is going to happen. They've got a model of the outside world represented in their brain, which can then manipulate that model and predict what is going to happen. And the way that might take place, the great insight into what might be going on uh, came uh, from uh, these two people, McCulloch and Pitts. And they were both working in Chicago uh, in the early 1940s. Pitts at the time was uh, barely out of his teens, an incredible young mathematician, entirely self-taught. He never went to university, but incredibly brilliant uh, logician and mathematician. And what they came up with was the idea that the very way that our nervous systems might be wired up might represent a logical system, a system that could carry out computations. And this is from one of their papers. Now, in the normal situation, you've got two nerves here, two neurons, two cells. This cell, number one, stimulates this cell number two at what are called synapses. That's the junction, the point at which two cells communicate with each other. And so the message comes down here through one and goes into two and then on straight up the brain. That's quite OK. But you might imagine a system in which you could have a cell which had two inputs, one and two here. And this cell three is only going to respond if it gets input from both these cells at the same time. In other words, if you're thinking in terms of logic, then this, is, this cell is computing an AND function. It will only respond if one AND two are firing, are telling it something, yeah? You can imagine an OR function here. In this version, the neuron three will only be active if one OR to a firing. If you get really clever, you can imagine a not function. This neuron here will only fire if one fires, but not two. Two has to not be responding, and then it will send a message. So any of you who've done any computing will recognize these formulations, and, or, not, if, these are the things that are the basis of everyday computing. And that's no accident, because in fact, this idea from McCulloch and Pitts was used to build the first computers. This man here, John von Neumann, he is the man who created the digital computer that we all use, that I'm speaking on now. The devices that you're watching on are all based on von Neumann's ideas. And although we now think that the brain is like a computer, at its very beginnings, the digital computer was like a brain. And von Neumann actually used the example of McCulloch and Kit Pitts to convince the American government to give him lots of money to build this device we can see behind him. Because he wrote in his document, you know what, we can build a device and this device will be like a brain. It will use this computation, this logic that McCulloch and Pitts claim is in the nervous system, and we will copy that. Now, it turned out pretty soon, in fact, that McCulloch and Pitts were wrong about how the nervous system is wired up. This is a very idealized representation of what happens, as we're going to see. But it did leave its influence in the computer, in the devices we are working with now. So, what we now think a brain does, I've got a, by taking you up to the beginning of the computer, this is basically, for the last 50 or 60 years, we've been thinking the same thing about the brain. That's more or less, since the 1950s, our ideas about what the brain does haven't really changed very much. And it's something like this, that a brain contains symbolic representations of the outside world, that it manipulates through computations, and those computations enable it to predict what will happen and to produce appropriate behaviors. And among the processes that are involved are things like feedback, inhibition, so stopping something from happening, and calculations about probability. How likely is it that one thing may happen 
rather than another. Now, that's okay. And that idea, which we've known for 60 or 70 years, is okay. And it's right, I'm sure. I'm convinced it's right. But it, it raises a massive problem. If that's our idea of the brain, how exactly does it work? What's happening? How are these processes represented in the brain? And part of the problem is that although our model of the brain is like a computer, is digital, neurons aren't. And that figure I showed you earlier on demonstrates this very, very clearly. Here we go. Although the existence or not of a response from the neuron, that is a digital event, it either responds or it doesn't, what a neuron actually tells the brain is not on off. It's showing, as we can see here, an analog response. It's increasing its firing rate. The number of these responses you can see in a given unit of time is increasing with increasing weight. So neurons aren't digital. And everybody knew this. And a lot of neurophysiologists laughed at McCulloch and Pitts. Uh, and indeed, their work is now mainly known for its influence on computing, not on uh, neuroscience. So neurons aren't digital. The parallel with the, with the computer is only really good for saying it in a very simple, quick way to give the idea that the brain is doing some kind of calculation. It doesn't actually explain how it works. I'll just explain that a bit more. I mentioned early on about synapses. So a synapse is where two neurons meet and it's a tiny little gap between them where the message comes here is transmitted by chemicals to the next neuron and then it goes on up into the nervous system. Now this gap, this synapse, is in fact remarkably complicated. There are dozens of neurotransmitters, often in the same synapse. A synapse can be activated or it can be inhibited. So this neuron may stop this neuron from firing. So it's not just digital, it's not just on or off, it's on, off, or no, don't respond at all. And the complexity of this surface is astonishing. There are over five and a half thousand different protein molecules in a human synapse. They are doing things. They are altering the activity of these neurotransmitters. They are changing them. They're uptaking. They're getting them back. They're stopping the, the synapse from firing. It is not at all like an electrical switch, or rather, it's not like any electrical switch we've yet built. And above all, just remember, let's go back to feeling things in your guts, to feeling your mind is, your brain is in your body. We have hormones. If you're frightened or excited, the way that you feel changes. Those hormones work by altering the activity of synapses. So uh, von Neumann recognized this very early on that he couldn't cope with the complexity of the nervous system in designing his, uh, his computer because there was this hormonal effect which he recognized, which he couldn't model. And, you know, computers are not bathed in hormones that are altering the activity of the nervous system, of the, of, of the computer chip. It doesn't work that way. I'll give you one example to prove to you quite how complicated it is. And here's my, my favorite organism, the one I've spent 30 or 40 years working on. And this is the maggot. It's the larva of Drosophila, the little fly. So these are tiny little bags. And as you can see, all it does is wriggle along. And it does this by stretching. And so it needs its body wall needs to know that it's stretched so it can perform the next movement in the cycle. So to do this, it has cells. We can see one here, which is glowing green because they put some special dye in it. And you can see here, it's got all these connections in the body wall where it can say, oh, I've been stretched. And then it's got these connections here, which are connected to the nerves, which are going to make the animal move. And we can see here, this is the head of the, uh, of the maggot. And this is its brain and this is what we're actually talking I even talk about its brain down here this is its nervous system which is in its belly uh, in a long line and is organizing this rhythmic movement now you might think that's quite straightforward well I'm afraid not even for a cell that is not in the brain that has simply got to say to the rest of the body hey I've been stretched we need to do the next thing now that's all it's got to say 
each of these cells here has 53 input synapses, so that's coming from other cells. It's got 18 output synapses, so it's talking to 18 other cells. And it's connected in total to 74 different kind of cells. And many of those synapses have more than one neurotransmitter in them. So all that just in one maggot stretch cell to say, I've been stretched, do the next thing. This is an astonishing complexity. No robot that has ever been built has got this level of complexity. And that isn't even in the maggot's brain. But you may say, well, don't we know about how the brain works? And isn't it all about lighting up? You've probably seen these images in the press. Uh, and this is functional magnetic resonance imagery, fMRI. And this is the first example of it. It was published in 1991. It appears on the front cover of Science. It was a very big deal. I remember seeing this cover. And what it's showing is that when a subject who's alive and is in a scanner is doing various tasks, then different parts of the brain become active. Now, this is often presented as explaining something, uh, that this bit of the brain is active when the subjects, I don't know, Doing, doing some mathematics. But does it really explain anything? And how, how good's the resolution? How, how, what's going on inside this, these tiny little glowing blobs? So I'm gonna give you some figures. And this is what is underneath, what rep is represented by each of what's called a voxel. So let's imagine it's a pixel on this. The, tiny, the, most sm the smallest unit of resolution down here or in here. Each of those voxels contains 5.5 million neurons, up to 55 billion synapses, 22 kilometers of dendrites, that's the input part, and 220 kilometers of output. Those figures are absolutely right, I promise you. I have triple checked them, I've read the original paper, that is quite how amazingly complicated the brain is. Furthermore, all this lighting up shows you, because it doesn't actually light up, in case you're any doubt, your brain's not glowing. All it says is there is increased oxygen flow at this point. It doesn't tell us whether those neurons, those 5.5 million neurons are being turned on or turned off. Are they activated or inhibited? We can't know that from fMRI. And above all, there's kind of a philosophical question, because doesn't this look a bit like phrenology, but with a fancy computer? As a neuroscientist put it, where is not how. Just because you know where something is happening, that doesn't mean to say you actually understand what's going on. And I can explain this a little bit through the thing we've understood the most in our sensory system, which is the visual system. Now, in the 1950s, the late 1950s, two American researchers called Hubel and Wiesel recorded from cells in the cat's brain. And what they were able to show was that different cells in the brain were wired up to different circular areas of the retina. So this cell here would fire if you projected a dot on this set of uh, cells on the retina. This cell here would fire if you projected a dot onto that bit of the retina. And what Hubel and Wiesel realized was that, I don't know, it's a bit like Smee's idea of a hierarchy. If you've got these four cells all going to a central cell, then now we can detect a line. Because if there's a line in the environment that activates this and this, and this and this, then this cell here, it knows there's a line there. It, we don't have a detector for a line, it just seems to be made out of little dots, but we can, the brain can make one by picking up the information from these four neurons. Now, this can lead to some quite remarkable results because if you think about it, what that implies is, okay, if we've got cells for a line, a line detector, do we have a detector for your grandma? Because, you know, you can recognize your grandma. It's just one cell in your brain that recognizes your grandma or Brad Pitt's or the, the, um, the Sydney Opera House. 
So that would suggest that you had to have a cell in your brain for everything. And you know, what if your your um, what if your your grandmother was standing on her head? How do you recognize her then? Because you can still see her. So clearly that can't be right. We can't have our brains full of uh, different cells corresponding to everything we could see because our brains aren't big enough. You have a brain the size of the universe to be able to do that. Something else is going on. And yet, 10 years ago, researchers were examining how the brain responds to visual stimuli in human beings. And these were humans who were going, they were patients, in fact, who were going to have operations to relieve their terrible epilepsy. And they very generously allowed neuroscientists to poke about in their heads with electrodes, I wouldn't do it, just before the operation took place. And so they put electrodes into the areas of the brain that fMRI studies had suggested might be uh, involved in recognizing faces. And they projected a whole set of images. And they found in one patient, a cell that only responded when it saw Jennifer Aniston. If you showed them this picture, with Jennifer Aniston with her then partner, Brad Pitt, it didn't respond at all. It was only interested in Jennifer Aniston. So that seems as though it's a bit like your grandma. Another human, another patient, had a cell that only responded to the Sydney Opera House. Another patient had a cell, he was an engineer, that only responded to a particular differential equation. Now, Philosophically, this is a bit of a problem because it looks from these experiments as though we do have these cells that are incredibly specific. So what's going on here? Because that can't be the case. Our brains aren't big enough, as I said, and you can see why. So what's happening is that, of course, they are recording from single cells, but these aren't the only cells that were activated by the picture of Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston. There will have been millions and millions of cells and a small subsection of them taken together represented the image of Brad Pitt or of Jennifer Aniston in the head of this particular patient. If they put the electrode slightly somewhere else, then they would have got a recognition of Brad Pitt. If they knew who this person was, perhaps it's somebody famous, I don't know, uh, but if they knew who this person was, a different set of cells would be active. So in fact, we're talking about large scale patterns of activity, not simply single cells that recognize everything. Now, some of the work that is being done on uh, computers might suggest there's a way of understanding this. And this is the work of Jeffrey Hinton, who now works for Google DeepMind, and they use one of these deep learning programs. And what they did was to uh, project the, uh, to give the computer program that they devised a, I think it was 10 million YouTube videos to watch. Now, the computer isn't watching videos, it's just looking at zeros and ones. So it's looking for patterns. And it, all they asked it to do was say, well, what patterns can you recognize in these 10 million videos? And to their amazement, because they didn't tell the computer what to do, to their amazement, this computer program ended up detecting cats. And this is what it could see. This was its ideal cat detector. You may not be able to see. I'll show you in a minute if you can't. There's an ear here. This is the top of the head. There's the other here. here. If you lean back and screw your eyes up, there's the whiskers here. There's the mouth. There are the eyes. And this was, this was a receptor for a cat that this computer program had just worked out by watching 10 million YouTube videos because there are a lot of YouTube videos of cats and the zeros and the ones that are represented, uh, that represent those video images are, fell in a repeated pattern that the computer uh, was able to notice. So you might think, well, this is the way to go. This is what we should be doing. We should try and use these computers to shed light on how our visual system works. Well, unfortunately, uh, there was an interview uh, in which uh, the interviewer said, well, there's a separate problem, which is we don't entirely know how these things work, these programs. And Hinton was very honest. He said, no, we really don't know how they work. They have no idea how exactly this computer program has worked its magic. So uh, 
if you're worried about driverless cars and the AI future, you need to remember this, that the engineers who are building these programs don't actually understand them. Okay, let's uh, see, there was the cat. There you are. So to give you some idea, I'm gonna close shortly, to give you some idea of the complexity of the brain, I want to introduce you to the work of Eve Marder. And Eve Marder is a, uh, a very eminent neuroscientist who works in America uh, at Brandeis University in Boston. And she has spent the last 20 or 30 years, um, well, she doesn't actually study the brain. She studies the lobster's stomach. Now, the lobster's stomach is composed of 30 neurons, around about 30. And these neurons are wired together such that they produce two very different rhythms of activity, a bit like we saw with the water beetle's brain, different patterns of cycling of activity. And the lobster uses that to power its stomach to grind up its food. These neurons are connected to muscles, which then can grind up the, the food of the lobster. Now, what Mard has been doing, as I say, for 20, 30 years, has been trying to understand how those two patterns of activity emerge from those 30 neurons. She doesn't know. She can model all 30 neurons. She knows exactly how they're wired together. She knows exactly their inputs and their outputs. You can see it's much simpler than the, the body wall of, a, of the maggot that I was talking about earlier. It's a very, very simple system, no thinking involved. And yet she cannot predict what will happen if she changes the activity of one cell or takes it out. She can't say what's gonna to happen to the rhythm of that network. What she has been able to show is that there is no necessary connection between the organization of the network and the rhythm it produces. The same network can produce many different rhythms, not just the two it normally shows. And secondly, the rhythm that we observe can be produced by many, many different networks. So there's no connection, no necessary connection between the organization and the behavior it produces. So what's the future? How can we, I promise you to talk a bit about the future. How can we resolve this immense complexity, this huge challenge of trying to understand how the brain works, what it does um, when we've got such complexity? And my answer is that we should be studying small brains, the brains of things, this is the maggot that I was talking about, the adult fly, uh, the maggot has about 10,000 neurons in its tiny little brain. Uh, the fly has about 100,000. Uh, the larva of the zebrafish, so this is a baby zebrafish, has got a few million. And the whole nervous system of Platineris, this aquatic organism, the larval stage, has been worked out. And that's a few hundred neurons. So they're all much more complicated than the lobster's stomach. But these organisms can all be genetically manipulated so we can make maps that are functional maps that tell us what's going on in a particular cell and we can then alter the activity of that cell and see what happens to the network. So I think that's what she, we should be doing. But there's a general lesson we can draw from all this, from everything that I've been talking about. We've seen that throughout the last four or 500 years of trying to understand the brain, that science, culture and technology are all intertwined and that technology has consistently provided us with metaphors for discovery. We now think the brain is like a computer, so we can look for computations that it might be doing, yeah? But we have to remember that as we saw in the past, these metaphors, like all models, are limited. They aren't going to tell the full story. And in fact, a framework, like a metaphor, is also a cage, it traps you. It prevents you from imagining some experiments. It prevents you from viewing things in certain ways because you can only think of them like this. So we may be coming to the time, and it's not only me that thinks this is many neuroscientists, that in fact the computer metaphor is beginning to run out of steam. We've got all this information from the most complex brains to the most simple lobster's stomach, and we still don't fully understand what to do with it. Now, we know that new technological developments will alter 
how we can imagine what the brain does. And when I explain that to scientists, they immediately get it and get very excited because they realize that what we know now will be reinterpreted and we will be able to imagine new experiments. So they then say to me, well, what is it? What's the next big thing? Uh, and I'm afraid the answer to that is I have no idea. If I knew I'd be incredibly rich and have won at least one Nobel Prize. Uh, sadly, neither of those are the case. So I don't actually know what the brain will look like in the future, how it will be interpreted. Although I have actually tried to find out. I've tried to find out by making a device that can let us see into the future. So I'm gonna, after this next slide, we're gonna see it. I'm gonna connect my computer to this futuroscope and it's gonna show us what the future holds, what the machines of the future are gonna look like and then we can imagine new things about the brain. Okay, I'm just connecting it now. Oh, oh no. Oh, it's, it's not working. Never mind. Well, that's going to be up to you, the audience. You're going to have to discover what the future holds. Thank you very much. If you want to know any more about any of this, uh, it's all in my book, uh, The Idea of the Brain, and that you can buy it from the Ratio shop at shop.ratio.bg. Thank you very much. I'm done. Right. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. All right. It seems it does seem that we are facing some uh, technical issues. So before I continue with the questions, if you just allow me to apologize to some of our viewers who have been experiencing some difficulties with the stream. Now, uh, it seems uh, that the issue is related to, uh, to, to only uh, one of the Internet providers, but we'll check this out. Either way, uh, we will be putting out uh, a recording for all of you guys to see uh, it should be running smoothly with much uh, better quality. Uh, so, yeah, we will, we will be trying to, working, uh, to, to work this out. Thank you for uh, referring to the shop. I'm, I'm sure that your book uh, is not on sale on Amazon as well. It's just on the Ratio shop, right? It's the That's the only place, place you should buy it. Thank you very much, Matthew. That's exactly that's exactly right. Uh, now, Matt, I, I do want to start off uh, first of all with the with the role of the metaphor, which does which does seem to be at the core of uh, of your book. Uh, now, metaphors do seem to be extremely uh, um, important, and uh, in general, you know, figurative language um, is uh, is important for scientists to frame their thoughts and ideas. So it's not really a very mundane or casual thing to do. You know, it has its implications. And, uh, you know, a metaphor is also a snapshot of the current zeitgeist, right? I mean, it yeah. carries with itself, you know, prejudices, some assumptions and some other things. So although you have no idea what the next metaphor will be, uh, what do you think we should be cautious about when we, when we find ourselves, you know, already <laughs> swimming within, uh, in this new reality? Um, well, yeah, well, that's, I've been asked a lot of questions, but that, that's very, uh, that's right to the point. Um, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> very good. <laughs> um, can we ask an easier question? No. Um, what I think is that I would be wary of uh, apparent attractiveness. So when I was an undergraduate, when I 40 years ago, when I was a student, um, the latest thing was holograms. Right. Now, the point about hologram is not that it's like Princess Leia. You know, and you can see it in, that's not the interesting thing about a hologram. A hologram, like you have on a banknote, is fractal. It's got the same information in every piece of it. So even if you rip it into bits and you shine a light on it, a laser light on it, you can still see the image. So in every part, there is the whole. So when uh, these um, uh, holograms were first invented in the mid 1960s, well, you can imagine what happened. Neuroscientists, some of the most eminent, immediately latched onto this idea and said, well, that explains our problems in trying to locate memory. Because it is everywhere, man. It's actually distributed. The brain is a hologram. So this metaphor, it wasn't even a metaphor, it was a strict correspondence. Now it's completely wrong. 
Uh, right. It's a very charming idea, very much of its time. Uh, modern students don't understand because they don't understand how a hologram works. But uh, the problem was, was that the researchers took it too literally. They took it as an exact model of what the brain might be doing. And it overlooked some of the clear evidence that there was for in fact localization of function and localization at least of access to memory uh, in the brain, if not of actual parts of the brain that are devoted to memory. So I think that the, the thing we have to be worried, another recent idea, cloud computing. Yeah, I mean, we're all used to it now. So our stuff's on the cloud, but when cloud computing came in, the same thing happened. Researchers started saying, oh, well, maybe, you know, these different, it's a bit like phrenology, that you've got these different units of your brain that are then connected and that it's like a big cloud with distributed functions in it. And again, uh, nobody uses that metaphor because it didn't actually help much and cloud computing right. became less sexy. I think that, that didn't help. Um, so I think the warning is if people try and use it too literally and uh, they all suddenly rush and can say, well, it must be this, then I think the alarm bells need to, to start ringing. Right. Uh, well, when we speak about the, um, you know, the method of inquiry or, or the philosophical outlook of how we seek knowledge, you know, what strikes me and I think is fairly obvious uh, uh, in your case that you, you do have the materialistic reductionist approach, sort of. Am I, am I correct in my assessment here? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, so my students hate me for this, but I always end up saying I don't know. <laughs> when don't they know. Ask <laughs> so, like, so even this, so this book, right? Mm -hmm. uh, about halfway through, the editor, he contacted me and he said, well, okay, he read a draft and he said, that's all very well, but how does the brain work? And I said, right. I don't know. And he said, yeah. you can't say that. You've got to have an answer. You've got to have an explanation. The, the, the audience wants it to be quantum this or, you know, something. I said, well, right. I don't know. You know, it really isn't clear. Uh, and in fact, <laughs> I'm quite pleased, and I think my editor accepts this now. Uh, many of the reviewers have said, yeah, this is right. We don't know, because all neuroscientists know we haven't got the foggiest idea. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And so for once, I'm telling it straight to the public. So <laughs> my, my view, I mean, a, a reviewer um, kind of pinpointed me, said exactly this. He said, you know, it's hard to tell whether he really, and me, whether I really advocate just going down to the simple basics or whether mm -hmm. I think that, you know, emergent properties can emerge out of uh, or complex organization. I think my answer is both, not very helpful. And I'll explain right. how. I think that there are emergent properties that, so for example, you know, I am speaking now, I'm made out of molecules, but you can't understand the way I'm speaking by referring to the activity of the molecules that make me up. That's, that's kind of obvious. Right. You can't understand what's on a printed page by looking at the fact that it's composed of certain molecules. It's got words on it, it's been printed, you know. So clearly there are things that emerge out of organization, but the problem is testing your ideas. Now there are loads of complicated mathematical models, which I don't understand. I'm very happy to say, I'm not a mathematician, I don't get those models in particular to try and explain consciousness, which for me, I mean, it sounds heretical to say, it, but I'm not actually interested in because, right. because I don't know how to study it. So I'm a scientist, I want to do an experiment. And there are some things that are, I think are so far distant that I can't imagine how to study in them. But what I would say to those people who do develop these complicated models, say of consciousness, is test them out test them out on something that we can manipulate on a simple system. Now, I don't think a maggot is conscious, but there must be principles about the calculations it's making, about the predictions it's making about the outside world, that your models should be testable on this very simple system that we can manipulate and change and then see whether your model actually works. And then we'd have a far, we'd have far better reason to say, well, this approach can say explain human consciousness rather than another one because at the moment there are loads of books I'm sure many of the viewers have read them or seen them uh, which all seem utterly confident that they know how the how consciousness emerges but they're all contradictory right 
Right. Um, okay, I have a, a couple of more questions on my own, just a disclaimer to the audience, and then I'm going to start asking okay. the questions because they're probably gonna be they're anxious, like, what is this guy talking about? Uh, I am not sure about that, but you do tend to answer them uh, in advance, you know, before I ask them even. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to move on uh, quickly. I, I, I want to refer to uh, really your zoological background here and speak about animals for, uh, for a little while. Uh, now, when we speak about... Um, uh, you know, analogous and the way we think about the human brain, we often think of it as, you know, the pinnacle of evolution. You know, it's the most complex neural system that we that we know. Uh, you know, um, its emergent property of consciousness is, uh, you know, undescribable and unknowable. So it's fascinating and amazing. Now, this focus on, on the human brain, when we think about intelligence and, and how we can you know, apply what we know about the brain in future technologies and this underestimation of how our animal brain works, does that prevent us, uh, you know, in going in other, you know, I would rather say more interesting directions like uh, like the, the, um, um, the for instance, the, uh, I'm thinking of the distributed neural system of the octopi, for example, or the distributed intelligence of, uh, you know, insects and ants. For, uh, for instance. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would be wary of uh, how distributed both the uh, the octopus mm -hmm. is. So the, the, the octopus um, can, I mean, it's got a brain that is, I mean, it's just a big slug. Don't forget, an octopus is a big snail. Right. So, you know, people go, right. oh, they're alien. They're not, they're just snails. <laughs> <laughs> but they live in the sea and they're very clever. Um, but yeah, the octopus is, so some of its tentacles have their own uh, nervous systems. Uh, but I'm sure many readers might think that men's penises seem to have a mind of their own. Um, so they're not, you know, they're, we're not everything's directly under our control in terms of how ants behave. I mean, people do use ants and they use them to model uh, swarm behavior in robots. And what you can show is that you get an emergent property from individual instructions. So you can get... Um, for example, that they, they make robots that will go and get something and bring it back to home, whatever home is in a big arena. And you program all the robots to do that. And then you get something very like what happens when the ants find, a, I don't know, a, a dead grasshopper. They all swarm around it. Most of them pull in the same direction. You always get right. a few fools that are going in the other way. But as long as there are more ants going home than there are going that way, then you get the, the appearance of coordinated uh, behavior. So I think that trying to study animals, I, I mean, that's what I study. I study animals. My, uh, I'm not primarily <laughs> interested in humans. I, I, I did psychology as a, a student and I've studied humans, but partly out of frustration with our complexity because we are so mind bogglingly amazing to try and understand what's really going on uh, I have ended up using very, very simple model organisms like uh, flies and maggots and ants. I've, I've studied ants a lot as well. Now, you're right to say that the human brain is the most astonishing object in the universe. Um, it's the most complex thing that we could, certainly that, that is, unless there are aliens, and you all know my views about that, uh, then the, the human brain is the most complicated object in the universe. And even, however, an insect is amazing. So Darwin himself thought that the brain of an ant was even more astonishing than the brain of a human because it's so small. Mm. And yet they can do all these things. They can learn. I mean, this is Darwin saying this. You know, he knew they could remember right. things. They could smell things. They could navigate. All that packed into that tiny little space. Uh, right. He called them the most marvelous molecules of matter. Um, and that, in a way, that's, that's what I, I think to get insight into how brains are working. I would predict, I would expect there are going to be general principles that are applicable at all levels of the animal kingdom. And so studying simple organisms will give us insight into the way that more complex ones like ourselves uh, function. Right. Okay, so you asked for simple questions, right? I have I have one from uh, from an audience member right now, so uh, I'm just going to go ahead and shoot it. Uh, so, what is the function of the mind? So, <laughs> well, you know, he he does he does have a comment here that uh, you know, according to Mister Gazinka, it exists only to reproduce. So, well, I I mean, 
I think the, the the basic function of all organisms is to reproduce. That's so right. the, the why why are we here question, whether you're a bacterium or you, Petco, you're just right. here to make more Petcos. That's your function in life. <laughs> Already done too. Already myself. done. Well, yeah. that's great. You, you've achieved your function. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I mean, so there's a difference between the brain and the mind. Yeah. Um, right. And... I'm primarily interested in the brain, in what it does, but I do know and accept that what it does, one of the things it does in us definitely, and probably in many other animals, is it produces the mind. And I don't know what that is, um, except I would be very confident that it is the product of the activity of our neurons. It's not anything else. Those neurons are influenced by hormones and all the things that I said in the talk. But that's all there is. There's nothing else. When we die, uh, you know, it stops and it doesn't go anywhere. That's all there is. Um, now, what is the role of the mind? Well, one of the slides that I had suggested that the, the mind and indeed the brain is controlling. So, as I said, we have lots of reflexes. This was began to be realized in the middle of the 19th century that control and inhibition preventing uncontrolled movement is one of the main things that the 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 brain does so suppressing the ego did you just go freud on me Matthew? no 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 <laughs> but suppressing movement suppressing movement right um so lots of our reflexes would carry on working if the the brain weren't stopping them from from taking place right. the brain plays a very important role in controlling activity the mind i think uh, yeah i think it, it i mean one of the things we can do is to conceive of what will happen in certain circumstances. Yeah, you can predict and you would give certain weight to some possibilities rather than others. Things that have happened in the past, you're more likely to accept they'll happen again. But I think the human mind does something absolutely remarkable and it's probably the only animal that can do this consistently. And that is we can read the states of other minds. We can mind read. Right. I mean, literally, yeah. I can mind read and I've been doing it. I mean, even without seeing people, <laughs> it's quite remarkable. <laughs> I, um, I'm, you know, I'm not joking. What I've done in this talk is to imagine what you, the audience, don't know. And I've imagined what you need to know to understand something. So I've presented a set of ideas and then by thought transference, because that's what speaking is, it's transferring ideas from me to you. Even more remarkably here, it's going into a computer, into a microphone, down the wires, you know, bounced up from a satellite, heaven knows how. And then finally, into the eyes and ears of you, the viewers, I have transferred those ideas. Now, that's just a, a very fancy way of what humans have done for 300,000 years. We've talked to each other. We've exchanged ideas. We've shown each other how to do things. And the unique function, the unique capacity of humans is to teach. So there's no other animal that it is accepted, widely accepted that they will teach each other. So even chimps, which use tools. So a chimp, for example, will get a, a, a chimp mother will get a stick and pull the leaves off and then put that stick into a termite nest so that the termites will then crawl up the stick and it can then eat it. So baby chimp will sit next door, right next to mum, and watch. But it just watches. Mum isn't going, -hoo -hoo -ha 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 -ha. and you know, showing, showing the monkey, the ba the chimp how to do it. it. The chimp just has to learn. So teaching, which is what I've just been doing, that mind reading and then transferring of ideas. That's something uh, only the human brain and really the human mind that mysterious ineffable quality we have uh only we can do as far as we know right right it's just interesting that you say that because all of this magnificence come out it comes out uh, uh comes out from uh, what uh, professor david linden from john hopkins uh, university mm -hmm. school of medicine says uh that the brain is a cobbled together mess oh so absolutely what do, you, what, do you, what do you think of this assessment oh yeah <laughs> yeah i mean francis crick said uh, who who not only uh discovered the co-discovered the double helix structure of DNA. He did a remarkable amount of work after he retired. So there's hope for me yet. After he retired, right. <laughs> he turned to neuroscience and mm. 
I, I was very surprised. I thought that Crick had, he went off to crack consciousness. That is one of the things that he tried to do. And clearly he didn't, he failed. He doesn't, didn't, couldn't work out how it worked. But what he did was to argue that we needed, for example, high level detailed anatomical understanding of how brains are put together, the brain, the human brain, but also animal brains, what we call a connectome, how the cells are wired up. The things I was talking about with the lobster stomach, that's a connectome, there's 30 yeah. cells. Now doing that for the 80 billion neurons and tens of billions of other cells that I've got in my head, that's not gonna happen. But we are making such things for mice. So what Crick argued was that you needed to have that information because you couldn't necessarily simply read back and assume what the, 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 the link between structure and function, you have to find it out because the brain is a mess, exactly. The brain right. is just, I mean, it, it just, it's, this is what evolution does. It doesn't make perfect things. It makes mm. things that are just good enough. Uh, yeah. you know, if you look at a, a human skeleton, it is absolutely weird. We've got these shoulder blow bones here, which these collarbones, which if you break, hurt like hell. Uh, and that's not a good way of organizing yourself, but it works. It's what tetrapods like us and cats and so on look like. So in general, in the body and in the brain, because the brain's just another part of the body. Yeah, absolutely. It's a bit of a mess. The exact function right. of the different bits is often less precise than we think. So one of the themes that runs through the history part of the book and into the present day, I haven't really had a chance to talk about it much, is this idea of localization. How much are things localized in particular parts of the brain? And although there are parts of our brain, as I showed um, with the, the experiments with the monkey, that you, know, you stimulate this part of the brain, it will twitch. If I have a stroke here, I won't be able to speak. So there is some localization. Whenever you investigate it further, there appears there are connections between different areas that are modulating how those activities take place. So the idea from the fMRI from the brain lighting up that this is the only bit that does a particular behavior, it really isn't true. It, it is very, yeah. very horribly interconnected. Well, and we can also speak about uh, interconnection not only within the brain, but also between the body and the brain. Absolutely. And we, we, we have a very interesting question here related to, uh, you know, I would say fairly recent uh, discoveries. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, if these are proper discoveries and, and, and these have been proven as concepts uh, and tested well. Uh, but I'm, I'm essentially speaking about the gut-brain relationship. Absolutely. So can you speak a, bit, a little bit uh, more about that? Yeah, so this is something that people are getting very excited about. And you have to be careful. I mean, you, you're right, Petco, to, you know, to say, well, maybe this isn't all true. Yeah. But, it, you know, part of the problem with the whole science fiction idea of uploading your brain, your mind rather, into a computer, right. is that, as a, a very famous article put it, the brain has a body. The brain is in the body. We are connected, as I demonstrated. So we're connected in you know, all our emotions, they're felt in the body and then change how we perceive our, uh, the world up here. And the same is true at a very micro level. So our, we have these microbes that live in our guts that help us digest. And the activity of these microbes is becoming increasingly clear, alters our mood. They may do this directly by producing the precursors of some neurotransmitters. So there are some people who argue that, uh, for example, in mouse models of some mental illness like depression, you can change the behavior of a mouse by altering its microbes. You can transfer the microbiome from one mouse, put it in another, and it will then start to show unusual behaviors because it doesn't have the right physiological uh, requirements to function normally. So, it, it the what there isn't is a very clear link um okay eat more eat more sprouts and you'll be happy eat more turnips right. and you'll be sad so it doesn't work that way people should eat a lot of vegetables and fruit and they'll yeah. less meat and they'll be well you know that's just basic Obviously, advice yeah. um and they'll feel better and so their brains will work better uh but this is something that people are very interested in the connection through 
uh, both nerves going from the gut up into the brain, but also just general circulating physiology and the basic uh, building blocks of what we need for our brain to function properly. Some of those seem to be provided by the microbiome. This right. these guts biota, yeah. All right, so, okay, so this is new and upcoming research. Let's speak about a little bit about new and upcoming technology. And uh, you know, I have noticed that uh, it is rare that we make an event and that we don't mention Elon Musk in one way or another. You know, it seems to be on everyone's mind right now. You know, we, you know, the billionaire genius who's going to save us all, you know, I guess, uh, that type of syndrome. Uh, but either way, he does work on a few um, interesting things. Uh, you know, one of them, obviously, the neural link. Uh, project that he works on. Now, not a lot is really known about, about this whole thing. Now, he did expose a little bit more recently uh, when he was describing that it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, essentially working on the, uh, on the electrical circuits. And in this way, you know, it, 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 this will allow, you know, healing Alzheimer's and all, all types of uh, other things. Now, how deep are you in this type of, uh, um, you know, how, how deep have you researched, first of all, the neural link thing? And, you know, what is your what is your general outlook on, on this technology? Yeah, neural link. Uh, so specifically on Musk, um, it's very hard to tell because, as you say, he had one uh, right. kind of show and there's been one uh, working paper. So it hasn't been subject to peer review uh, that I have read because uh, I'm very interested in it. So I'll follow it. Yeah. And uh, it, at the moment, it's underwhelming. Um, in that what he's doing is he's going to be able to make uh, a system that can record with many, many electrodes. So people who work on vertebrates, mice and rats, uh, and even humans for therapeutic methods will be very interested in this. So I, I, you know, I think there's going to be some good technology for neuroscience mm -hmm. coming out of it. What I'm much less convinced about is that he's going to be able to wire anything up in any meaningful way uh, to, I mean, so that the idea, the neural lace idea uh, he's taken from the science fiction books of uh, Ian M. Banks, who also yeah. provides the names for the, the the big platforms that his amazing rockets land uh -huh. on. So, you know, this is a science fiction idea that you can have something implanted and all of a sudden, you know, the works of Shakespeare, you know. Uh, so that's a great idea. But I think from just the, the, the real figures, not the science fiction data, the real figures about the complexity of the brain that I've been describing should give you some insight that that's probably not on the cards for centuries. And then there is the question of, well, would you want to have it? Because we do use such implants at the moment. So there was a study uh, that came out just last year uh, and it was really very alarming. So this is a study done in Australia where patients with severe epilepsy, really bad epilepsy, debilitating epilepsy, can take very strong medication immediately before they're going to have a seizure. And they know they're going to have a seizure because they've got the electrodes in their heads, which can tell when the, the brain is getting into a seizure state. And so basically right. they have the electrodes up here and then beep, 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 I tell tells them I take my pills. So it's a very, very simple system. And there were, there were some anthropologists, some sociologists who wanted to know how the patients felt about having these devices in their heads. And one patient in particular, when it was first put in, she said it was horrible. It was like having an alien in her head. She felt like she was being invaded. But then as she gradually realized that this enabled her to function normally because she could take a medication at the moment she needed to, she absolutely fell in love with it. And it became yeah. essential for her to work well. And then, because this is Australia, which has privatized healthcare, the company that made and owned those devices went bust. So they had to take it out. So oh, she wow. now felt that part of her had been taken away. So right. we might want to think <laughs> twice before putting something that first is going to feel like an alien, then is going to feel like a friend, and then you don't own anyway, and somebody else is going to come and take it out. Now, having said all that, that there is one, I mean, that, that technology clearly in that particular patient's case was very disturbing, but there is a technology and you can watch this on YouTube and it is fantastic. So Parkinson's disease, where people have terrible tremors, uh, can be cured. It can be cured by deep brain stimulation. So you have to have an electrode deep into your brain. 
then you have a connection pad on it. So it's not terribly pleasant, but by deeply stimulating areas of your brain, basically you can see this on YouTube. I advise everybody go to YouTube, Parkinson, deep brain stimulation, and you will see people who can barely walk, who are instantly at the flick of a switch are now in control. Their lives are transformed by this technology. It is extraordinary. So, are you serious? That's yeah, the absolutely. first time I hear absolutely. that. Yeah, no, it's, it is amazing. Now, not everybody who has, uh, who has Parkinson's it has the right kind, because Parkinson's is a very broad right. description of a set of uh, symptoms. But some patients can have their lives transformed by this deep brain stimulation. Now, it's a very risky operation as well. I mean, again, you know, do you want somebody opening yeah. up the skull and putting stuff in? But in some patients, it is transformative. So going back to the question, you did say it's underwhelming because it's going to be a variation of one of those things. It's not, uh, well, you're I, skeptical about the high claims made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I think, I think right. what he's going to come out with is a very useful experimental system for uh, inserting electrodes and maybe connecting certain areas, uh, certain electrodes in a very small area. So I think the micro technology that is developing is going to be fantastic for people who say work on the mouse brain and they'll be able to stimulate it in new ways. But I don't think that, yeah, you'll be uploading Shakespeare into your brain. Right, right. <laughs> not in my so, life. So, so, so it's not going to be, uh, you know, conceptually something that different or mind blowing. It's just going to be an amazing piece of hardware, you know, that we have. Well, to, uh, with the proviso that he understandably, because all this is under patent or he wants to keep right. it secret, he hasn't yet explained. We haven't yet seen what exactly yeah. he's got in mind. Ha ha. Um, as far as we can well, tell. Been, uh, yeah, but, but but I mean, it's been crazy. I mean, he says that in five years, language will disappear. I think he's yeah, yeah. Nuts, That's you know? what, every, not, everything. Yeah. Bit of advice. It's always yeah. five years. Yes. People <laughs> always say it's five. Five years is close enough to be exciting. Well, uh, not so close that somebody's going to say, "Wait a minute, you said that was going to happen." If you say a year, they they remember and they come back and they say, "Come on, where is it?" So five years is just enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now that we are in, uh, you know, swimming in the science fiction waters and, you know, and we are into a speculation territory, we have a question about the, um, you know, another, uh, you know, interesting, interesting theory and research that has been done. And obviously there are articles published. So uh, we are using you, you here as a fact checker, you know, is this bullshit or not? So brain to brain coupling. What is yeah. this all about? Um, well, again, I think that, you know, let's go back to the lobster's stomach. I mean, right. we can do brain to brain uplink. I'm doing it. This is it. Mm -hmm. This is it. Oh, this is it. Okay. This is me doing it. Right. It's, I'm speaking. That is exactly it. So the question is then how, what could you get from somebody else? Um, now you might uh, be able to certainly get emotions. So again, this is a bit gruesome, but it's on YouTube. It's a real experiment. These are experiments that were done in the Soviet Union in the 1940s, uh, where they grafted dogs' heads onto each other. Yeah, so they, I've, I've seen that. Yeah, that uh, and it's then, real. Yeah. So, you know, when I first yeah. saw it, is this, is this true? But it absolutely is. Now, this isn't sticking. What it's doing is connecting the, the, is connecting the, the blood vessels. So right. if what that would mean is that you've got this and this dog, one head is effectively paralyzed. It can't move because it hasn't got any control of the body because we can't connect the neurons. They're, they're severed forever. But what is happening there is if one dog had a particular emotion, excitement, hunger, enjoyment of eating, and that was based on hormones, then the other brain would feel that. That I'm absolutely certain of because it's transmitted through the blood and that, that we can, you could do. So if you wanted to graft somebody else's head onto you, um, yeah, you could probably do it, but I don't advise it. And you know, anybody who thinks they can escape death by being grafted onto somebody else, yeah, you would. You would be like, uh, you you probably, depending on how it's done, you would probably have control of your mouth. You'd be like a, a tetraplegic person who's had an accident mm. you know, who can't move. Now, people who have tetraplegia um, have can have very fulfilling and amazing lives. But and it's certainly better than being dead. Um, but uh, you know, you would miss out on so much. Uh, and I'm not, uh, yeah, I mean, a you wouldn't get a medic to do it, and right, it would, it would be horrible. You'd have to find somebody who's 
shoulder you wanted to be grafted onto. On. So you have to find a, a partner or victim. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, it's very gruesome. I mean, one thing that you, you can do, uh, and this is to do, again, to do with people who have tetraplegia, uh, and there's a picture of this in, in the book and linked to a, an amazing video. So this is a woman who has been tetraplegic for the last 10 years from a multiple stroke. So she, she can only move her face. And they implanted electrodes in part of her brain. And then she learned to control a robotic arm using her thoughts. Now, these connections weren't directly in the part of her brain that controlled movement. So it's not neuro Elon Musk's idea of connecting exactly. But she learned to control you know, the brain, they had a computer which would learn to recognize the patterns of her brain waves. And in the end, in this astonishing video, this is from about eight years ago, you can, she can control the uh, robot arm, get a cup of coffee, bring it to her mouth and drink. That's the first time in 10 years that on her own, she'd been able to drink. Wow. So there is astonishing technology. And part of the problem in the book was on the one hand, getting over the excitement of science and the, the amazing inventiveness of colleagues who are working on, you know, very, very complicated systems and they're coming up with solutions to real problems like that. Yeah. And then trying to bring us back to saying, well, that's amazing and could transform lives, but it doesn't necessarily tell us how the brain works because what the computer is learning is patterns of activity, uh, which it can then decode and, you know, she's learning by trial and error how to move the arm. It's not actually right. directly connected to the nerves that once enabled her to lift her arm uh, in, a re in her own body. Right. Uh, well, now uh, I, I want to take a step back and speak about the new technology in terms of, uh, you know, the tools that we develop in order to study the brain. And, and there are you know, a couple of interesting development here uh, that I want to address. And uh, one of them is uh, the human brain project and their idea of uh, you know, developing a brain simulation that we can use to study the brain. Uh, and the other one is uh, about the uh, connectome mapping yeah. uh, technology as well, if you're familiar yeah. with that. So can you, can you just you yeah. know, give us a brief overview of these? Okay, so uh, the, the, the human brain project is a mammoth uh, pharaonic, as the French would say, you know, big enough for the pharaohs projects, the biggest peacetime scientific project there has ever been. So the only thing bigger has been, I don't know, the Manhattan Project to build the atomic bomb that was clearly in the wartime, or the project to put the, you know, men on the moon. Nothing else compares. It's it cool is, that I mentioned that in the footnotes, like literally, it's like a, the biggest human experiment. Yeah. It, talks, yeah. it is absolutely huge. And it is thousands, billions of euros. It's all funded by the EU, billions of euros, hundreds of researchers, thousands of students are going to be trained by it. And you might think I should be very pleased, but I'm not. And a lot of neuroscientists aren't. Uh, we got very cross when the project was announced because it's really about computing. Um, and most of the approach to it is in computing, not in neuroscience. So they claimed that by the year 2020, they would have a completely functioning model of the human brain in a computer, assuming that they could build clever enough computers. Now, I don't know any neuroscientist who would have given them the time of day with that prediction, but the European Commission thought it was great and they went along with it. We're over halfway through the project and uh, virtually as soon as the project began, they cut much of the neuroscience. And there were, you know, there were petitions by hundreds of neuroscientists complaining about this. Anyway, there's been a lot of complaint and the organization has changed, but they produced two big papers um, a couple of years ago, last year, uh, over halfway through the project. And what they have done is to model a tiny part of the, the rat's brain, it's about a, 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 a millimeter wide by two millimeters long, something like that. So a tiny fragment of the brain of a rat that is devoted to whiskers, whisker movement. And this is a model that, that only includes neurons. And we know that the brain is full of other cells. There are things called glia 
that insulate neurons, that stop them from transferring messages inadvertently, and that actually alter the activity of neurons. They're not anywhere in the model. Now, the model worked in the sense that it produced nice rhythms, which is the first thing they were hoping. And it, it didn't fall right. over, it didn't break, you know. So it was a bit like the, uh, the activity of the water beetle. It produced something that looked like what a brain would do. But it's not actually a model of the rat brain. It's certainly not a model of the human brain. And there are no insights that came out of it. So Ed Yong, the uh, science writer who many uh, viewers will have read, um, he wrote a big article in the Atlantic last year. And he said, well, you know, I've talked to everybody and everybody doesn't think much of it because they don't seem to have found anything out. Um, so I fear that a lot of that money has been used to developing new computers. And I have colleagues at the University of Manchester who are very happy because they've yeah. developed amazing new computers that can do amazing things. But I don't think it's gonna tell us about how the brain works because the brain is not a computer and we've got hormones and we've got glia and, 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 and. Uh, and I think that that was not a good use of money. Now, so that's that. The other projects I think are much more interesting, uh, but again, there's a lot of hype about them. And these are connectomes. And I said earlier on that Francis Crick insisted that we needed maps, clear maps of how the nervous system is connected together. Uh, and he's absolutely right about that because although where is not how, so a map doesn't tell you how something works, it just tells you where things are and how they're connected, it's the starting point. We need that to understand diseases, to understand basic functions. Now, part of the problem is that when people say a connectome, different uh, funding institutions, different researchers mean different things. Now, when I talk about connectome, I mean, how are the cells connected? Yeah? Right. But none of the projects that are working on, say, a mouse can do that. We've got 70 million neurons in a mouse brain. We, uh, so at the moment, I have colleagues who are working on the maggot connectome of the maggot brain, 10,000 cells. This will be finished not in five years, but in two years. And there are, there are about 30 labs have been working on this. And this is the connectome of a maggot, one individual. They right. know that different maggots are wired up in slightly different ways, <laughs> just like you and I are. That's but, depressing. I mean, this yeah. is still going to be an insight. And right. the power of this is that it's a functional map and they're already using it to generate predictions about, say, how the maggot will roll over. So maggots don't do very much, which is why they're interested mm. in the stupid. <laughs> one of the things they do is if you poke them with a needle, it will roll over because it's trying to escape a wasp. So there are parasitic wasps that want to lay their eggs in the maggot, like an alien, you know, and then <laughs> come <Yeah>. out. <laughs> so the maggot wants to avoid that. So it rolls away if you poke it. And using this connectome that they have established, my colleagues have been able to work out, not entirely, but more or less, the wiring diagram and the states of the various neurons involved in saying, my God, something's poking me. I need to activate these muscles to roll away. So we've kind of got there. Eventually, in a couple of years, we'll have the full connectome of the maggot brain. And that I think will, as it already is, in fact, give us insights into learning and other things. So I think connectomes are fantastic. Most of the connectomes we hear about in the press, so the Allen Brain Institute, they're focusing on mammals and in particular on mice, and they are much higher level. They're looking at nerves, which are composed of thousands, that's hundreds of thousands mm. of neurons. So it's a different level of complexity, but that is, has to be our starting point. I don't dismiss that work at all. I think it is essential. It's often very beautiful. Uh, but we need to be very clear about what insights it will and won't give. And it's a kind of staging post. It's an initial map. If you imagine uh, we're going to have a map of Bulgaria with all of the major cities now and all of the transport connections and the telephone connections between them. But we don't yet know about the villages. We don't know about those interesting yeah. little roads that are connecting them. We may not, know, in fact, know about the rivers and the hydraulic right. system, which is also important for Bulgaria as a country. 
So you've got to start somewhere. And we're at that top level at the moment. Uh, and it's going to take a long, long time. So my guess, I say this in the book, um, none of your five year nonsense. I think that to understand the maggot brain with its 10,000 neurons, that is going to take 50 years. That's my guess. 50 years. 50, 50. for the maggot. Yeah. Um, simply because you poke it, it rolls over. Yeah, like yeah. some people well, actually. I mean, we can work that out, but to do everything right. else, and by, when I say understand, what I mean is we can predict exactly what will happen if we remove a cell, change one cell's activity. We have yeah. a complete understanding of it. So we could then put that into a computer and we've got a robot maggot exactly the same and it will imitate. And perhaps, I'm not entirely joking here, perhaps if we can do that, then something like a maggot's mind, if such a thing exists, might emerge. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I, I talk it very, you know, in, in passing about maggot's mind. Yeah. When I was younger, I was much more down to earth and would have dismissed that as being just nonsense and a fairy tale. But given we don't that understand is. how it works, I don't see any reason to imagine it's impossible that some kind of higher representation can emerge out of a, a, a model of those 10,000 neurons. That, that doesn't it seem to me crazy. And if you want to call that a mind, I mean, I don't think the maggot's sitting there having thoughts. Well, I don't think it thinks I'm a maggot um, and I'm going to be a fly. It's not thinking that way, but it, it is representing the outside world. It's doing all those things that brains do. And I don't see any reason why a mind, a higher level representation of the activity of those neurons, that's all it is, wouldn't emerge from such a model. But that's half a century away, I guess. So the, the robot right. killer maggots won't be taking over and coming to get me because I'll be dead. <laughs> all right, uh, Matthew, a couple of last questions. Uh, okay. And, you know, I, I guess it's going to be impossible to be brief because they're addressing again, you know, very... <laughs> Very, it's very be impossible no, to be brief because I'm not. That's why. Uh, no, well, you said it, you know, but <laughs> you are extremely eloquent, so you you really uh, compensate, uh, you know, with with the beauty of your speech. But either way, uh, because we're running uh, ahead of time a little bit, but I, I do want to address those. Uh, so, describe, you know, quickly if you are familiar again with those. What are brain organoids mm -hmm. and optogenetics? Okay. As two methods to study the brain. Go. Yeah. So these are two exciting methods that I, I deal with in the in the book. So organoids are small blobs of cells that we can get to start creating a mini organ. Now, these are were initially used to study things like the heart or the kidney, and you can get at basic cell how cells are connected by getting uh, stem cells. So these are cells that can be become anything and yeah. then programming them, stimulating with chemicals so that they then go down a pathway of becoming say a kidney. Now, these live in a, a, a vat, in a, in a, they live in a, a Petri dish, so they can't get very big and they, they lack the rest of the things they need, but they can develop very basic physiological functions. So they're extremely important for um, understanding how very basic physiology like the kidney or the mm. liver works. Uh, my, my good friend Phillips uh, Ball has written a, a book recently exactly about this. You should get him on here and get him talking about it. Um, now, the, they have started doing this with the brain, which is kind of obvious. And this has started to set alarm bells ringing. Now, this can't grow very big, okay? These little organoids, which are often of human cells, it can't get more than a few thousand cells. But those connections that those little neurons spontaneously make have started to produce rhythmic activity, a bit like we saw in the water beetle. And that's right. a basic property of neurons. They will start to talk to each other and produce these rhythms. And quite eerily, one of these organoids started to develop a, a bit of eye retinal tissue and to connect to the rest of the brain. It's not brain, what? it's brainlet, seriously. So you shone a light 
on this retinal tissue and then the activity of the network changed. Wow. Yeah. So this is amazing yeah. <laughs> and also very alarming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so bioethicists, there's been big articles in Nature about this. Nature is the leading science magazine say, look, we've got to think really hard. Nobody thinks these things are conscious. But as I've just said, who knows? <laughs> now, they're, they're very undifferentiated. So there's not there's nothing complicated going on in there. What I have been very unimpressed by is, uh, I, th I mean, I thought it was actually sick. Uh, a colleague in America, I say colleague loosely, is a scientist, famous scientist, has come up with the idea, well, okay, we've got human organoids. Why don't we make a Neanderthal organoid? Because we know exactly the genetic differences between a human and a Neanderthal. So we could make a Neanderthal stem cell. We could change a human stem cell in ways that make it like a Neanderthal and then create a Neanderthal organoid and then connect up the, or this is literally what he said, connect up the organoids to little trolleys and race them. We have a freaking Dr. Mengele here. Yeah, absolutely. Is so it's absolutely terrifying. I mean, uh, I hope he won't get ethics approval for doing that. I mean, the, <laughs> the ethics of it are very weird because these are just yeah. lumps of cells, right? They are tiny, tiny. They're barely bigger than a pinhead. They are really small. They can't do anything complicated, but they are eerie. And uh, I think that there will be more, well, there are going to be more ethical discussions because we need to work out what we do with this. Is this allowed? Yeah. Yeah. And we should we be doing this? Um, and, you know, or should we just be saying, well, OK, just on the safe side, let's not. <laughs> um, of course. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's for organoids. Optogenetics is a fantastic technique that was first developed on the fly. This is why my maggots and my flies are so important, because virtually everything that we do is first developed in these tiny, very simple systems. And what it enables you to do is to put a, uh, a, a receptor for light into a cell. So you can have a cell, I mean, I, you may remember, actually I showed some optogenetics at my mm -hmm. talk uh, in the Palace of Sports or wherever it was years ago um, on, uh, on smell. What we did, we got a, a maggot and we put into its, uh, into its neurons, its smell cells, a receptor for light. And what the, why you do that is that you can then turn that cell on by flicking a switch. If you shine mm. a light on the tissue, then that cell will now be activated. It is literally like a switch. So we were able to manipulate the activity of our maggots by turning lights on. And they would think they had their maggot mind had the illusion they were smelling something because that cell was being activated as far as the maggot's concerned, that's a smell cell. Oh, there's a smell over there. Off they went in the direction of the light, just like Celino, the electric dog. Yeah. Now, that's, that's, that, that's okay for me, but what about you know complicated brains? Never mind about maggots. So in a mouse, you can use this to manipulate memory in the most eerie way possible. So you can turn cells on and off in a mouse's brain. So you've, you've got to open up the mouse's head, uh, you've genetically altered the mouse, so it is now expressing these cell, this particular receptor in a particular kind of cell. And then you have to put a, a light or have a, a torch basically embedded in the mouse's head. Sorry if this is upsetting people, but it's all quite painless. Um, and what that means is you can now alter the activity of single cells in the mouse's brain. And what researchers have been able to do is to make a mouse remember something that never happened. So you can imagine you've got two inputs here. We've got an input from one part of the brain which says, oh, I, I ate something. And another part of the brain from saying, oh, I heard a bell ring. And they're connected in this cell here. And what we're now going to do is to activate that cell. So that cell is now saying, oh, hey, when that bell went, there was food. But it never happened. Right. You can make a good memory bad. So you can show the mouse a particular image and give it food. But then you change the meaning of that memory. And the mouse now thinks that that image 
is something unpleasant. It associates it with something unpleasant. And you can do the opposite experiment. You can even erase the memory completely. So you can put your mouse in your cage, give it an unpleasant experience in one part of the cage, a shock. The mouse will keep away from that corner of the cage very sensibly. You then activate single cells in the mouse's brain and it will now go to that place because it's forgotten that it ever happened. So science fiction worlds of Philip K. Dick are here. In a mouse, in a mouse, in a mouse. Okay. In a mouse. In a mouse. In a mouse. Not in a still, human. You, know, you can't is... do, you know, it's too complicated in a human. Right. And you would never get ethics approval. Uh, but this is what you can do. So the problem here, this is we're coming back to my problem. I've got this amazing result, just like with the Jennifer Aniston cell, which is my God, that's astonishing. And we've got to put that into the context of, well, really. The mouse's memory isn't just composed of one cell, it's composed of lots of cells. And what we've done is to disrupt the network. Just like when they were recording from Jennifer, the, the cell, it looked like they were really interested in Jennifer Aniston. In fact, there were millions of cells that were all kind of vaguely interested, just like this cell. And it's that overall pattern of activity which produces the perception. Same thing in the mouse. What we've done effectively is to break the pattern. We've broken the pattern of activity so that now it's forgotten. But it wasn't just one cell that had the memory in it. Yeah? Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I, I, I certainly hope that the scientific community uh, and the ratio of psychopaths to normal people you know, <laughs> is the same as in the general population, you know, well, around 1%. Uh, because you guys, you know, uh, you know it's, it's fascinating and terrifying at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that that was, I, yeah. I, I would reassure people that the scientists take the ethics of this very seriously. Um, sometimes they make jokes about it. Um, so one of the titles of one of these articles about these mouse memories included the word inception from the film. Yeah. Where memories, well, you know, who knows what's, is, hey, is he it's awake or is he asleep at the end? Yeah. Tell us. Um, so the scientists are aware of all the dystopian possibilities. They often refer mm -hmm. to them in their articles and uh, ethics bodies in universities and research bodies and learned societies take this very, very seriously. As I said, with the example of the organoids, there was a big article in, I don't think, I mean, I think this is too important to be left to the scientists. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, yes. hey, we know what we're doing, but to reassure viewers, we do take it seriously, but you need to take it seriously as well. Yes. But remember, you may say, well, people shouldn't be doing these experiments anyway. They shouldn't be doing the experiments on, on animals at all. Okay. But the experiments that have saved people's, transformed people's lives with Parkinson's, those deep brain experiments, could only be done by testing them on animals first, on animals that had a model sure. of Parkinson's. And you need to be able to test that, just like they're testing the, va the, the vaccines for COVID on animals first, then on human volunteers, then finally we'll all be given it, I hope. Um, you need to pass by the animals first. And so for treatments, for treatments for mental health, all of that work has to be done by scientists on animals before we can dare to start thinking about trying these treatments out with humans. Right. All right, Matthew, uh, I do have like one last request from you. Now, obviously, the book uh, will be on my summer book list, uh, you know, to read uh, and explore. Yes, you can you can show it to the people. It's a very fancy edition. Uh, it's nice it's to the touch, it's nice to the look, and it's nice to the brain as lots well. Oh, look of at neurons, that. lovely color very pictures, beautiful. lots of uh, figures inside from history explaining key things. Beautiful, um, yes. Yeah, color images. Let's show you a, here's that picture. Here's the picture of Kathy, the woman who's being fed an apple in this case. This is a, not quite right. baked, but this is an image. This is the lady who had her life transformed by being connected to this robotic arm. <laughs> and again, just to remind people, only available at Trazio Bookstore, right? So beautiful book. Uh, so besides your, your book, you know, can you, can you just uh, again briefly, you know, give us a couple of um, of recommendation books that that we can read? Because if your read is mind blowing, you know, I want to have a couple of more, you know, that that, that to make my my summer meaningful. Um, 
Well, I think if you're still interested in neuroscience, if you want to know the, the current state of neuroscience in a really easy uh, read, uh, then there's a book called Cracking Neuroscience by John Turney. That's J-O-N, Turney, T-U-R-N-E-Y. And that will give you all the information about the current stuff. Now, I've talked a little bit right. about this, and there's a lot in the book, but that will really give you uh, an exciting viewpoint uh, of the uh, the current situation. As to other sites, well, you didn't tell me you're going to ask this. I've got to... Yes, I'm sorry about that. I can only yeah. think about my book. Um, uh, you can go with that one only if you think that it will be sufficient. Yeah, I, let, let's of, just go uh, with that. I can't. I've now. I've, I've been talking for two hours, man. My head's gone. <laughs> and, uh, I, I was about tell to, you what, to say I'll that. Tell you, you, I'll tell you what. I will send uh, you. Matthew's summer reading list, some That's interesting fine, yes. books, which you can then put on the website with links to the bookstore Very and good. people Very can good. buy. How about that? You see, you, you, that sounds perfect, but you did ruin my joke. I was going to say that you write, but you don't read a lot, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... I <laughs> Anyways. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's not true. Anyways, uh, thank you very much uh, for everything, Matthew. That was that was really, really fascinating. It's always a privilege uh, to have you on. And I do hope to see you in the flesh, really, next time. Absolutely. Hour. Well, um, I'm working on a couple of things at the moment, uh, Paco. Right. So I hope that next year, when this is all over and we're all well and fully vaccinated and can go out, we can go mm -hmm. out and have a beer in uh, Sofia or a lovely glass of Bulgarian red wine. And I can meet you all again because uh, my trips to Sofia have been fantastic. Everybody yeah. has been so generous and the public yeah. have been marvelous. So I haven't been able to be in contact directly with you this time, uh, members of the public, but uh, my, you're there in my heart as well as in my brain. <laughs> Very good. Thanks again, Matthew. Okay, you thank have you. a good bye evening. Bye bye, everybody. You Stay safe. Bye. Look after yourselves. Bye bye. Okay, Danny, was for that. Uh... Надявам се, че това, че това наистина ви е харесало. Аз със сигурно слушах с огромен интерес и, а, и това, което казах съвсем не беше случайно. Матио е един от а, малките хора, които си позволяваме да, 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 да викаме а, колкото се може по-често. Именно защото мисля, че сами станахте свидетели на а, първо на страхотната му риторика, на нещата, за които говори. А, наистина ние много, много си го обичаме. Надявам се да е в добро здраве и да го видим отново. А, да се върнем отново на книгата на Матио, може да намерите тази книга в нашия сайт, в RACIO.BG, slash store. Освен книга на Матио, там е селекция от, от различни неща, които са препоръчани от нас, от екипа на Рацио и от, разбира се, учени гости и наши, наши приятели, с които сме си говорили за книги. Следващото събитие, което предстои много набързо, на 2 юни ще си говорим за дигиталното образование с, с няколко много интересни хора. Първият човек е Васко Лозано, с когото сме записали няколко подкаста. Васко е заместник директор на Испанската гимназия, философ по образование, страхотен човек за разговор с много широк ум и интересни идеи. Та с него ще обсъдим неговия личен опит в тази трансформация, която в момента виждаме в образованието. И компания всъщност ще му правят още още няколко а, интересни а, човека. Ще си разговаряме и с основателя на Уча се Дарин Маджаров, а, който също ще е част от а, панела, на който а, ще, ще дискути, дискутираме тази дигитална трансформация. А, и също така Яница Господинова, която е преподавател и е част от програмата Заедно в час. А, отново 2 юни а, тема, която е много актуална, много интересна и сме ви подбрали наистина много интересни гости, така че може да се включите отново онлайн за сега. И ако искате да ни подкрепите, може да си купите един дарителски билет, за да подпомогнете това, което правим. Като говорим за помощ, благодарим отново на всички патреони, които продължават да са така щедри с, с парите си и да подпомагат разпространението на науката в България. Ние се стараем да го правим максимално добре и надяваме се да прощавате дребните ни книги. А, иначе, а, що се отнася до това какво ние правим, какво планираме да правим в бъдеще а, и кои сме ние, може би най-добрият начин да го разберете и да ни следвате е като следвате в Facebook, в YouTube, в Instagram, в Twitter. А, вече сме горе-долу навсякъде, имаме акаунти в Discord и всякакви други неща, но това е за привилегировани хора, които, които, които ни дават пари. А, допълнително, като говорим за съдържание, в момента фокуса ни е а, основно, освен върху това, което в момента виждате и разбира се върху нашия подкаст. 
А, там отново продължаваме с трите формата, имаме научни а, новини всяка седмица, имаме интервю с учен или интересен човек а, и нашият формат Vox Nihili, където си говорим за пресечните точки а, между науката, философията, правото, етиката и всичко останало. Така че ако вие сте от хората, които слушат подкасти, които оказва се не са толкова много в България, между другото, така че ако сте от тези, които го правят, чувствайте се, не знам, странно като младсинство, предполагам. А, така, какво друго остава да кажа? Да, ако продължавате да бинджвочвате, се седите в къщи, нещо в което се съмнявам, седейки по това колко хора има по улицата, а, можете да гледате неща, които сме правили а, и в миналото и продължаваме да качваме в момента. Ако отидете на рацио БГ на коне на черта видео, може да видите общо взето цялото ми съдържание през последните 8 години. Изключително еклектична селекция от всякакви а, научни теми под биология, през физика, космос а, и включително и няколко странни неща, като професия пилот, например. А, така че влезте, харесайте си нещо, може да бинджвате и така. Общо това беше, позакъсняхме малко, аз съм сигурен, че, че се е струвало. Отново за онези от вас, които имаха проблеми, ще качим а, този запис а, а, за, последващо, за последващо гледане. А, благодарим отново на тези, които ни подкрепят, благодарим за вашата лоялност, благодарим за вашето внимание и това е всичко от мен. Хубава вечер. Чао!